The Self-Helpful Podcast is brought to you by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping life and leadership coaches. Visit Ziggler.com and let them inspire your true coaching performance. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining me as I talk with today's most important influencers, guides, and changemakers to uncover what truly drives them and extract the big takeaway from their personal journey and their greatest wisdom. I'm your host, Kevin Miller, and this is Self Helpful. In this episode, I'm back with Connor Beaton. In the previous episode, we talked about how to embrace manhood and also be human. In this episode, we talk about what drives Connor personally. I start off with something he disclosed in his book where he shared that an overall driving force for his life has been the reality that he has been abused and he has abused. He has been hurt and he has hurt. And from this, he discusses dark motivation and light motivation, the essence of drive. So we dive deep really quick here. Connor, again, is the founder of Man Talks, an international organization focused on men's wellness, success, and fulfillment. He's a coach, facilitator, teacher, podcast host, and speaker, helping men from all over the world find purpose, a joy-filled life, and a confident self-identity as a man. His new book is called Men's Work, a practical guide to face your darkness, end sabotage, self-sabotage, and find freedom. His popular podcast, which I was just a guest on, is called Man Talks. So here we go. Connor, I'm going to start this one off a little different as this is the What Drives You uh, episode. You, in your book, really at the beginning, you actually listed out your driving force at that time before you came into this, before you came into what we talked about in part one, you said, my driving force was I have been abused and I have abused. I have been hurt and I hurt. And on the topic of men and being a man, I thought I resonated with that because as I look back, it's part of a big part of my book. What drives you is, is a part of my story of, things that were driving me that I didn't know. And as you, you know, just that as a lead into this, that was, you said that was your driving force. What, how did you realize that, that, oh my gosh, it was that a realization that this is what I didn't know it, but this is what is driving me. Is that what happened? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I sort of bottomed out. I hit rock bottom. Um, at a point in my life and, you know, lived out of the back of my car for a few weeks because I was stubborn and didn't want people to know about what was going on in my life. And what I started to realize over, you know, the sort of year or two after I bottomed out um, in working with a mentor who at the time, you know, he was in his early 70s and I was in my late 20s and I was you know, working with him and he, he had a background in Jungian psychology and I was sort of working with him. I started to realize that a lot of what was driving me in my life was this pain that I had been carrying that, you know, was very shame-based. And I started to realize, and I, I call it dark motivation and light mm-hmm. motivation. And I started to realize that a lot of my life was driven by this dark motivation or the shame-based motivation, right? To prove people wrong, to, you know, create this wonderful image of myself, to, yeah. um, you know, to make up for the insecurities and the, and the inferiorities that I had, you know, to make up for the fact that I felt like I didn't have a deep sense of self-worth. And so my whole life up until this rock bottom moment was really driven by, I don't feel good enough and I don't feel worthy. I don't feel like I have a deep sense of value. And so I need to do something to prove that wrong. And so my whole life was sort of curated around that. And after I bottomed out, I slowly started to realize, one, that really wasn't workable. And two, I felt that way because I had grown up in an environment where I was really hurting, you know, where I, I was hurt sometimes, you know, emotionally abused, physically abused sometimes, um, it verbally abused. And so 
I carried that forward in my life. And that, that unconsciously, I didn't, obviously it wasn't a conscious driver, but that unconsciously yeah. drove me to make certain decisions and take certain actions and be reckless and hurt other people. And it's not because I wanted to, um, it's not because I wanted to do those things, but it's because there was something in me that was, that was just sort of steering the, the wheel of my life. That, totally. I, I, I refer to it in the book as the co-pilot. Uh, that yeah. we often allow to be doing that. And I, the hidden drive, the thing that what I finally had help getting pointed out was how I kept sabotaging things. Uh, and it came to fruition in business. And, but I would sabotage it for some issues I had around my own self identity. Ultimately, it mm -hmm. had nothing to do with the business, had nothing to do with uh, business plan or financial projections. It was me sabotaging over and over. Well, that's why I wanted to ask. And I appreciate you talking about yeah, the dark motivation and the light motivation. So this is a show where we're asking about, I'm asking about the light motivation. So we're, we're <laughs> the, the moving you towards like the things that you're doing to stay out of that drive, to be conscious of your drive. And uh, first one here that we hit is spiritual. And you told me before that you grew up in a, it sounds like a religious uh, structure uh, somewhat. And you also hit on spirituality in our first talk together by talking or just referencing the aspect of the soul. Hmm. So I'll, I'll throw those out to ask you, yeah, what is driving you today spiritually? It's a big question. I, I mean, I think my yeah. relationship to spirituality has, has evolved and transformed a lot over the years. You know, like you, like you said, I grew up in this um, sort of more staunch or strict religious upbringing. Um, I rejected all that, you know, when I was like 18, moved out of the house, I then went into college and studied um, theology a little bit, not as a primary part of it, but I was very curious in religion and very curious about spirituality. <clears throat> and today, you know, I think today I have a, in my, what would be in my own words, a very sort of deep connection with spirituality. Um, it's something that has been has been driving force in my life for a very long time. And, you know, I, I meditate, I do breath work. Um, I have grounding exercises and, you know, exercises that come from different spiritual traditions, Buddhism, Taoism, um, different yogic traditions that um, I'll use in order to allow myself to feel a little bit more grounded. I do Tai Chi sometimes, which, <laughs> you know, is, is uh, at first, you know, I'm, I, I'm like six, one, 200 pounds and the, and I played hockey growing up and I'm very much, I used to do some like minor body bodybuilding and I love lifting weights and being very physical and the idea of moving very slowly yeah. and just breathing and moving energy around at first was like, what the heck is this? <laughs> but it's become something that I really uh, deeply enjoy. And so I have a ton of quote unquote spiritual practices, but I think the real spiritual practices for me are in the moments where I'm just being present to what's happening in me and outside of me. And they're normal moments. They're everyday moments, right? It's, you know, stretching in the morning with my son outside. It's walking through nature and uh, receiving the sounds of birds and wind moving through the leaves. And it's just being, it's practicing being deeply present to whatever moment I find myself in. And so I, I yeah, maybe I'll just pause there because I think that's some of what it looks like and a little bit of how my relationship to spirituality has, has shifted and changed quite a bit over the years. Your testimony right there at the end, Connor, reminds me of someone we just had, did a series on in the show here. Uh, the book is called The Power of Awe, and mm. the concept is microdosing mindfulness so that you know mm. listening to the 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 wind through the trees and and feeling it taking notice of it not just the thinking of gratitude but actually taking it in so we had jake eagle on the show and it was tremendous i've continued to stay in touch with him and dig deeper into it and you you remind me of that you, you know the next one here 
is relationships. And I had said in the first show that I was going to come back to something that you said, and this is where I wanted to do it. You said you had, if I understood, you have a group of of guys and it sounded like 10 ish that you get together. uh, And you said they're all, all dispersed around. So I assume that it's, um, uh, virtually, you know, like this zoom or whatever that you get together and it's weekly, but then maybe there's even like a, or you said that you had a group online or something like that. And so there's even daily communications. Tell me about that. Yeah. So it's a, a group of guys. Some of them I've known for, you know, over a decade <clears throat> and other guys I've only known for a few years, but we meet up weekly. It's virtually, um, we share our wins, our challenges, our triumphs, our, you know, the obstacles that we're facing in our life. And we really support one another and challenge one another uh, in those calls. We also meet up like right now I'm in Idaho and two of the guys from that group are here. So we're, you know, we've brought our families together. We're vacationing together. And so, you know, we're, we're sort of committed to you know, doing life together. Our kids are hanging out, um, you know, which is just a a wonderful, wonderful thing because they're all somewhat in the same age range, uh, which is really nice. So yeah, that's, that's the group. It's sort of a very informal structure, but you know, in my, in my business, I've built out a, a a membership for men and we've got, you know, four or 500 guys in it that do a very similar thing where they, the guys meet up on a weekly basis they might go through a book. Uh, there's a monthly challenge, you know, um, it's really like uh, meant to be a place where you're building very deep bonds. And it was all sort of predicated off of this, uh, men's group that I, you know, had been a part of and helped to sort of forge in the beginning. And it's great. Yeah. We've, we really share life together, which is awesome. Just, just from a quick tech standpoint, that group of guys, do you meet on an online platform of some sort? Uh, we just do zoom. We just okay. show up on a, on a zoom call. And then, uh, we, you know, make the commitment to meet up at least once a year, all as a group. So every year is, so like last year we all met up in Hawaii. Um, this year we're looking at Peru. Uh, and then we have like little meetings like where guys will you know some of the guys in the group will get together when they can because everybody everybody does live in different spots um but which is you know makes it challenging to meet up every single week in person yeah (laughs) but yeah yeah, but we but we all do meet up uh consistently as often as possible that's that's awesome well then from a, a bigger standpoint too or a primary standpoint just when you look at relationships what would you say is your primary drive, looking at the relationships in your lives that you're striving for? Depth. Depth is, is definitely the, the primary drive. Um, I had a lot of surface level relationships in the past, like friend, a lot of surface level friendships, a lot of uh, intimate relationships with women that were sort of depthless. Hmm. And I found that for me that, that wasn't, satiating you know i never really felt fully satisfied and so i think the driving force for me is is really about depth and um there's a story behind why that is i don't know if that's necessary for for this conversation but you know i think for me i really look for relationships where i can know i can know as much as possible about the other person and feel comfortable with them knowing as much as possible about me. I like this idea that I don't have to trade my sense of authenticity of who I am for connection, for relationship. And I want to be able to be expressed, be known, be understood, to have a sense of belonging with the people that I surround myself with fully, without having to wear a mask, without having to be performative, without having to, you know, like, be somebody that I'm not or pretend or withhold or not talk about certain things. That's not it for me. I, I want relationships and and I think I've done a pretty good job of curating relationships specifically with men in my life where none of that has to happen, where I get to just be me. Um, and I don't have to perform and I don't have to pretend and I just get to show up 
and be who I am around the men in my life and vice versa. They just get to show up and talk authentically about the challenges that they have and that I have and to talk about what's really happening in our lives in a very real and authentic way. And so for me, the driving force is, is definitely death. And in the walking out of that is that you use the word curating. It's the intentional curating, curation. And I would then say probably, and then nurturing of those mm-hmm. relationships. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's, uh, for me, it's, it takes effort, you know, like it's to have depth in your relationship. You, you It's a commitment. You have to work to go a little deeper to scratch underneath the surface, you know, like when one of my buddies is saying, Hey, I'm having a tough time with work, but it's all good. It's like, well, my commitment is then to follow up and say, well, what's actually happening? You know, is your company struggling financially? Are you, are you bored with something? Are you considering a new product? Like what's actually going on? Tell me what's happening beneath the, like, I'm struggling a little bit, but it's all okay. Um, so the, that's kind of the curation of it is, letting I try and be as curious as possible with, with my relationships to really understand the full scope of what the other person is experiencing or thinking or going through. Um, and that curiosity, I think leads to, leads to the depth. So I think that, yeah, curation, curiosity. And then I think the last one would just be consistency. Yeah. You know, I think we under, under index or undervalue consistency as a very important trait when it comes to relationships. Like I will, I'll actively reach out to as many of the guys in my group as possible every single week. Hey man, how are you doing? What's going on? How's your kid? How's business? How's your, you know, you've been trying to lose 10 pounds. How's that going? And so just consistently reaching out because I find that for me, I can, I can very quickly fall into the guy that just like waits by the sidelines for a buddy to reach out and I like won't engage. And so I've kind of challenged myself and pushed myself to be the one who's just like constantly creating the connection, um, with, with the men in my life. So I think that those, they ended up being three C's, but those are the three C's (laughs) for me in order to help create the depth. It sounds, so it sounds like it is, this is a, this isn't uh, out of these categories here. I mean, the relationships, nurture, you said curating, nurturing is a big priority. I mean, so that's mm-hmm. a, that's a primary part of who Connor is and what you're going to invest in on a given day. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I run these small, like eight man, um, men's groups called the men's self leadership program. And one of the things that I ask the guys in the very beginning the first thing that I'll say is this group is about learning to tend to another human being, learning to tend, T-E-N-D, tend to another man. And it's not something that we normally think about. It's not something that we normally prioritize, especially within our male relationships. And, and for me, um, that is a priority. How can I tend to somebody else? How can I, you know, prioritize them and what they might need? And to just check in on them for no good reason, to love them for no good reason, to get curious about their life for no good reason. And in doing so, create a bit of a dynamic of, hey, I care about you and I'm, I'm prioritizing you. I'm putting effort into this yeah. and, uh, and to have that reciprocated, right? To be the, to sort of be the leader of that. And then it, you know, it, it's oftentimes reciprocated. And so... I think that that's an important piece is that notion of, of tending to the people that I have chosen very consciously to have in my life. Yeah. How about health and wellness? Tell me what uh, drives you in regards to your personal health and wellness pursuits. Ooh, the, this one's been a bit of a journey for me. I think um, you like growing up, I was, I did not grow up in a health conscious family, uh, you know, so I would have the double chocolate chip Costco muffin for breakfast and then get sent off to school, you know, and get home and have, you know, a 
bag of chocolate chips and a bag of raisins and pour it into a bowl with a four liter jug of, of milk uh, sitting beside me watching TV. And so I, I didn't exactly grow up eating healthy. Um, mm-hmm. And I was very prone to overeating and I was very prone to eating way more than I needed and eating late at night. And so I, I had very poor health habits. Um, and fortunately or unfortunately, I was one of those people who it was very hard to tell. Hmm. I never really looked supremely out of shape, even though the way that I was eating and treating my body was not good. Um, and so I, for a very long time, have not had a good relationship with my body. I've never really liked it. I've treated, I've treated it. I treated it for a long time, very poorly. And over the last several years, I really made a commitment to try and and reshape that. And so for me today, what that looks like is a number of things. One, I don't drink. I don't do any drugs. Um, I've been sort of like uh, clean and sober for three plus years now by choice, not because I was an, you know, um, an addict, although I have certainly had addictive behaviors in my life. But I just know that a lot of addictive behaviors, actually, um, <laughs> just to clarify, mm-hmm. but um, I don't drink, um, you know, no weed, no drugs, no pharmaceuticals. Um, you know, thankfully, I, I just haven't needed any of that. But I don't drink mostly because I think, one, I've seen what alcohol has done to people, my family and friends and their families. Uh, two, it's just there's no real health benefits to it. And so I'm a huge advocate for sobriety. I really believe it's one of the best things that I've done. Um, so there's that, you know, there's the basic stuff. Like I try and get a decent, you know, seven hour sleep. Um, I've prioritized, you know, not being on my phone for two hours before bed, not eating two and a half to three hours before bed. I, uh, in the last probably four or five years have really enjoyed doing intermittent fasting. So I'll do a 16, eight protocol where, uh, you know, I'll have an eight hour, um, eating window between usually 12 and eight. And I'll do that a couple times a week where I, you know, I won't eat breakfast and I won't eat until about noon and then I'll have lunch, uh, and then I'll have dinner and then I won't eat after eight o'clock. And I've found that my body's really responded to that energetically. Um, I'm li- I've limited the amount of coffee that I drink, the amount of caffeine that I intake. Um, I don't drink sodas and stuff like that, but I think the bigger picture is, you know, I'm, I'm turning 40 in November. And in our last conversation, I talked about this notion of like pushing our edge and seeing what we're capable yeah. of. And so I've been on this mission to be in the best shape of my life by 40. And I've never really set any goals like that. I've never really cared. You know, I'm at, at one point, like I'm, I'm six, one to 200 pounds. Now at one point I was, I was 245 pounds, uh, in my early twenties. And I was working construction and not really taking care of myself. And I was pretty, I was a pretty big boy. Um, but it's been interesting because it's, it's really changed my habits. Like I used to hate working out in the morning mm-hmm. and now I love it. Like now I want to start my day. Um, and so maybe I'll just give you like a little bit of what it looks like in the morning. Yeah. So I'll wake up, I'll drink a glass or two of water. Maybe I'll have like some greens whether it's uh, Athletic Greens or Organifi, because I love that. I love their stuff. Uh, and then- You can say I'll AG1 go, on this because we advertise for them. Yeah, so AG1. Yeah, yeah. I, they, I love their stuff. And then I'll go outside and I'll get some natural sunlight. And usually my son will come out with me. He's two, just uh, like he's around in the base, like two and a half years old. And I'll stretch. And so I'll do like 10, 15, 20 minutes of stretching in the morning. So it's a combination of- just like stretching out my hips and my hip flexors, which are just the the tightest damn thing. Uh, And doing some like yoga and my son will join me. Uh, He's kind of gotten in the habit of like, (laughs) if you follow me on Instagram, you'll probably see this one video where he's, uh, he's doing stretching with me. And so he'll do stretches in the morning with me. And that's usually first thing. And then I'll go inside, I'll make a little bit of coffee, um, probably like an hour, hour and a half after I gotten up. I'll have a little bit of coffee and then I have a gym in my basement that I built out and I'll go get a workout in. Um, I'll usually work out five, five to six days a week. 
um, once a week I will put on a 30 pound weighted vest and I'll go for a five kilometer hike, um, which is really, really good for cardio. And then uh, a couple of times a week I'll go do MMA. So I'll either do kickboxing, Muay Thai or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, and I've really, really enjoyed that, but all the time in as often as I can, I'll do that in the morning. And I found that that has really stabilized my energy levels. And so I've, I've focused a lot on health and wellness lately. And so those are some of the pieces. Maybe you want to uh, dig into any of that, but that's a little bit of, of what I've been doing to maintain that part of my life. Any, well, I mean, the main thing I would, I'm curious about with that is obviously we look at that and think, okay, that's great, you know, for your physical body. But as you have pursued that, what have you noticed mentally? <sighs> I think it's, for me, it's much easier to regulate, you know, it's much easier to, if I start to feel angry or frustrated, um, it's much easier to find equilibrium again. Um, mm -hmm. that's one part. I think a second part is like my energy levels are just much more consistent. Um, you know, I, when I was a kid growing up, uh, I like to say I was like one of the first guinea pigs on Ritalin. So like in grade three, they, you know, they said I had ADHD and put me on, you know, Ritalin for a number of years. And so I used to have really big spikes of energy where I, you know, just have this volatility, this huge volume of energy where I needed to just be doing and going constantly. And then it would plummet eventually and I wouldn't want to do anything. I'd want to sit around and play video games or just watch TV for hours on end. And I went on that roller coaster, you know, for a very long time. And what I've found in the last few years is I've really made a lot of these changes to when I eat, how I eat, what I eat, when I work out, how I work out, what I do for my training. Uh, my energy levels are much more consistent. And so I don't have these massive spikes during the day where like I just have to go and do something. And then these, you know, really low valleys where I just don't want to do anything. Yeah. So I think that's the, that's the other piece is just a much, much more consistency within my, within my energetic levels and output. And you mentioned food. Is there any kind of nutritional structure you adhere to specifically? Not necessarily. I mean, chocolate chips really, and raisins and a bowl of milk. Yeah, <laughs> if that, yeah that, uh, that habit isn't there anymore. Yeah. Uh, you know, I really try and stay away from, from sugars, processed food. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'll have dark chocolate you know, I love chocolate, but well, I that's think spirit, that's spiritual. That's a different thing. That's right. That's right. That's uh that's soul food right there. No, no, I mean the big thing, my wife and I try and cook at home as much as humanly possible. And so we've really gotten into the habit of inadvertently doing almost like a paleo diet where most nights we'll just have protein and vegetables, you yeah. know? So it's like a chicken and a vegetable or sausages and a vegetable or, you know, steak or w whatever it is. And so the majority of the time it's, it's that, you know, at, for breakfast or lunch, I like I'll oftentimes do uh, like a superfood oatmeal. If I've had like a really big workout in the morning, you know, with like bananas, peanut butter, gr you know, granola, uh, goji berries, that kind of stuff. And then, and then oat oatmeal, um, or I'll do eggs, avocado, you know, uh, fresh red peppers. Yeah. Cuc cucumber and stuff like that but it's a it's a lot of just you know eating clean um you know trying not to consume a ton of gluten but i'm not so strict and regimented that like i never eat bread or i never have a pizza or pasta i just uh, it's i think i'll probably go through a couple months before 40 um so like n next month august and september uh or september and october where i'll cut out gluten entirely and, um, and really like make sure that I'm not doing any sugar just to, um, reach my goal of being the best shape of my life by 40. I think I'm, I'm 
pretty much there right now. Like I've, I'm definitely in the best shape that I've ever been in. Um, but I think I've never had a six pack before and I'm just on the mission to have a six pack at 40. I just think that that's, you know, something that I'll look back on when I'm 80 and just feel proud about because I've just never been able to do it. You know, I've had big biceps and big shoulders and chest and legs and all that type of, but I just never had a six pack. And so, um, I think there's something about that, uh, that sacrifice that feels meaningful to, to achieve at least once. And so, yeah, most of the time, just clean, healthy, you know, cutting back on gluten as much as possible, not eating a bunch of refined sugars or processed food. We'll look for the uh, six pack Instagram picture in the the coming months. Uh, (laughs) The next one is, is mind mental health, you know, mental state. And you've already mentioned uh, some of that in, in the spiritual category and here in health and wellness, you've talked about that, but yeah, anything else? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. When you look at mental state, uh, specifically, what is the thing that you're driving to achieve or avoid? Hmm. For me, I've always gravitated towards the state of equanimity. And I remember reading, uh, I got really big into Zen and and Buddhism and Taoism a little over a decade ago, probably 10, 12 years ago. And I kept reading about this equanimity, equanimity. And what it means is balance in the face of chaos or calmness in the face of chaos or peace in the face of chaos. And so for me, my mindset is always about how can I move closer towards this sense of equanimity, this being calm in the chaos, because it's not always peaceful inside of me. It's not always peaceful in my household. It's not always peaceful in my business. It's not always peaceful in my nervous system or in my mind. You know, my mind is very uh, quick and lots happens. You know, I think like most people, uh, I joked around with a buddy the other day. I don't know. Do you know who Russell Brand is? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, I was joking around with my buddy that the, the, uh, the ticker tape, my thought process in my mind is like Russell Brand talking at full speed, (laughs) (laughs) which is like, if you've ever heard Russell Brand talk, I was like, that's pretty damn fast. You know, there's a lot of volume and content. And so for me, that's, that's the drive is how do I continue to find, to expand my tolerance for chaos for volatility, to expand my tolerance for the unknown, you know, the things that might not go the way that I want. And so that I I love that notion, because with that, it's really about finding a sense of acceptance, love, appreciation for the internal turmoil that sometimes spins up. And to remind myself in those moments of like, this is okay, too. You know, this is all right. How do I find, how do I find a sense of peace with this? Can I, can I feel a sense of calmness in this? And sometimes that means I need to go do breath work. Sometimes it means that I need to sit in meditation. Sometimes it means that I need to go get into an ice bath. Sometimes it means that I just need to go hug my son or my wife. Um, you know, sometimes it means that I just need to go sit out in nature and listen to the birds. But so there's many, many different pathways that can lead me back to that. But that's always the drive. How can I expand my capacity for equanimity? Well, is it fair to say then that or you, I think, well, that, that awareness, obviously, would you then say being aware of the feeling, aware of the turmoil, aware of the chaos that's going on internally or maybe externally, it's causing it internally to be aware of it. And then would you say to acceptance? Maybe, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that oftentimes with these types of states, with these types of, with our mind, that awareness and, and sitting in the awareness for as long as possible uh, and using the breath are some of the only things that we have sometimes, yeah. you know, if you listen to any sort of spiritual tradition or, or meditative tradition, there's really not a lot to quote unquote do, 
right? It's like become aware and try and stay aware for as long as possible. And eventually that internal state will shift. It'll subside. And oftentimes the bringing of awareness to our internal experience, right? If you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling volatile or angry, the bringing your awareness to that experience and maintaining your awareness on that experience and breathing into that experience will dissipate it. Yeah. And so, you know, because there, and the reason why I say that is because I've worked with enough men now to know that our logical brain usually goes to, okay, awareness and then acceptance. How do I accept? <laughs> what do I yeah. do? How do I accept what I'm feeling? How do I accept what I'm experiencing? And what I've learned over time is if I can just keep the spotlight of my awareness there for long enough and stay with the breath and can continue to uh, deepen the inhale and lengthen the exhale. So letting your exhale be longer than your inhale, which has, uh, is proven through research to lower your heart rate. Um, if you lower your respiratory rate, you will lower your heart rate, which in turn will downregulate your nervous system. And so what I will normally do when I'm you know, feeling something that's unsavory or I, you know, I don't particularly like or want to be feeling, it's just that. It's just stay with the experience and breathe into it and maybe use some breath practice. And that, that is the acceptance. That is the acceptance to let it wash through me. Well, and it's interesting because my propensity would say, so what do you do? And what I hear you saying is, in essence, whatever it takes to be, whatever yeah. it takes to be, if it takes an ice bath, a hug, breath work, whatever to be, but the Jedi move, I guess, would be if we could just be aware and then just be and deal with it. And, right off and the, the breath. I think I really want to yeah. emphasize the breath, right? Like the breath is the modulator is the is the the modulating dial between the stressed part of your nervous system and the calm part of your nervous system and so if you find yourself in a state of anxiety or anger or frustration or you know grief and you just feel overwhelmed your breath is the the dial that can help modulate down into a more what's called down regulated state or a more peaceful, calm state. And so learning to use the breath, whether you do box breathing, right, which is inhale four, hold four, exhale. Most people have heard of that now. Um, or inhaling through the nose for a count of four, holding for two, exhaling out the mouth like you're blowing out through a straw. So like for a count of seven, and then holding for two. That, that breath cycle, if you do that for about two minutes, has been clinically proven over and over and over again to help your body reset, to help your nervous system down regulate. So this is, that's actually the breath cycle that they give to um, PTSD patients. So like, you know, guys that have, or, you know, men or women that have gone out into the war and that have PTSD and they come back when they're having a panic attack or uh, a PTSD response, that, that breath pattern can be very good. Um, if you're having a more intense response, like sometimes I think there's a misconception around panic attacks and anxiety attacks uh, in the sense that like you just need to calm down most of the time what i've seen is that you you actually need to move energy out and so when people are having a, a like a, you know i've been leading workshops where men have had a panic attack or an anxiety attack or you know are having a, a type of like trauma response and, and oftentimes what's needed is not a calming down but a moving energy out so I might have them, you know, punch into a pillow or like really try and grip onto something or, uh, you know, have another man. So they'll grab another guy's hands and like really push on that guy's hands because they need to move the energy out because panic attacks and anxiety attacks are often uh, a buildup of energy within the body that we can't release. So I know that's a little bit of a side tangent, but no, I, I, I love it. It's, I mean, I, I do that. That's well, box breathing has become, um, a dear friend to me. Mm -hmm. I was, when you started saying that I looked down at my watch to see, okay, what's my heart rate. And it's, it's a little high 63. Cause I don't, I sit here and I kind of breathe shallow, you know, we're doing this. So I'm a little amped and I gotta take a deep breath and do that. But then the other one, uh, to your, you know, anxiety issue. Yeah. For me to go ride or run, sometimes I just, and that's when I get. Yeah, it just it just resets. 
you know, I come yeah. back and then I can think clearly and whatnot. So no, I resonate uh, significantly uh, with that. Next one, Connor, is work, career, uh, business, you know, what, what your, your vocation in essence. What would you say today is driving you in that regards? Uh, I mean, it sounds, as soon as I heard it in my head, I was like, oh, that sounds cliche. I, I think the big piece, what's driving me is impact, sure. you know, is, um, is healing uh, with the, the men that come into our ecosystem. And in some ways, it's the same as it is within the relationship aspect. It's depth. It's helping men tune in to a, a deeper aspect or a deeper part of themselves a deeper truth within themselves, whether that depth is, you know, being able to express and share something that they've never talked about, whether it's being able to um, give them the tools to more deeply connect with the people in their life, their spouses, their kids. Um, but it's depth, it's impact. And, uh, and honestly, it's, it's healing. And healing, I think, has an interesting connotation to it. Mm -hmm. Because we operate in a culture and a society that has in some ways almost weaponized psychology <laughs> within our modern culture and, and, you know, modern conversations. Um, and so I think sometimes when people hear the word healing as a drive, uh, it can put them off. You know, I think it can really put them off. But for me, healing is more about a deeper level. We talked about it in our last conversation. It's, it's about self-leadership. For me, the result of healing, especially for men, is self-leadership, that you have a deeper level of trust with yourself. You have a deeper connection to uh, a sense of sovereignty and inner authority, and that you have a more workable relationship with yourself and the people around you. So that's what I mean when I say healing. That's what really drives me. It's like if I can help men stand more fully in their own potency, not their own power, but their own potency, their own capacity, their own capability, their own sense of like, ah, I really trust myself to make the right decisions, to lead my vocation, to lead my family, to lead my relationship, to lead the intimacy and the connection in my life. That to me is almost indescribable. You know, mm -hmm. when I have when I have men reach out after weekends, or I have you know their their partners or their wives or their girlfriends or their kids even reach out and say, you know, thank you so much. Uh, you know, so and so has come back and is just. I feel like I can trust him. I feel like I have him more fully here. I feel safer with him. I feel more loved by him. I feel more trustworthy of him. It's like, that's it. You know, that's really what drives me at the end of the day. Not the praise and the validation, but the knowledge that that man is going back into his life more capable yeah. of contributing to the people that he loves, contributing to the places where he wants to add value. That to me is, is really what drives me. I appreciate you. Yeah. Power is not my favorite word. It's got lots of baggage, but potency. I haven't, I'm, I'm ruminating on that. That's, that sounds like the, you know, the fullest aspect of myself, the, the, the true flavor of me, even, uh, mm -hmm. potency. I like, I like the word. Uh, well, it, it, and on that, you said, you know, with your work, what doesn't drive you and you didn't, or what does drive you, you didn't say money, which I, I, it's not surprising, but I will ask you what then that's the next one. And what does drive you regarding however it resonates with you, money, finances, wealth, uh, even, uh, possessions. This has been an interesting journey for me. Cause I, I, I really didn't grow up with much. Um, you know, I watched my, my parents, my mom and my stepdad, not struggle, but I, yeah, I just didn't grow up with much. You know, I heard all the same sort of adages and sayings that most people heard, right? Money doesn't grow on trees. Uh, my mom actually worked for a bank. And I remember when I was 
uh, 16, she got me my first credit card and it had a $500 limit. And mm. <laughs> I had just bought my first car. I bought a 79 Mustang, you know, for 500 bucks, not on my credit card. Uh, and a few months of having my, my visa, I couldn't pay the damn thing off. It was just always maxed out. And I had a $500 limit. I just could never pay it off. And I remember going to my mom and asking, you know, I can't seem to pay this thing off. Like, what advice do you have? Because me, I'm like, I'm 16. She works at a bank. She's got to know more than I do. And she says, don't worry about it. That's just a part of life. And I was like, okay, I guess it is. And, you know, I would spend the next long time, you know, 10, 12, 15 years just in debt, in a lot of debt, you know, a lot of credit card debt, a lot of student debt. And so in the last couple of years, not couple of years, in the last probably several years, uh, cleaning all that up, getting out of debt and really educating myself about money because I had no clue. Nobody, yeah. really, you know, my, our education system doesn't teach us about money. doesn't teach us about finances. doesn't teach us about taxes. doesn't teach us about business, uh, you know, loopholes and tax structures and all of those types of things. And so I really had to spend a lot of time educating myself about money. And now I really enjoy the game. I enjoy the, I like buying stocks. I like studying markets. I like understanding um, different asset classes. Like I've really immersed myself in the pursuit of trying to understand this thing that at the end of the day, all of us have to contend with and is probably one of the most influential relationships that we'll have, you know, but we don't often think about it that way. <laughs> and so for me, I really started to understand in the last few years that we all have a relationship with and to money that we don't often think about. And for most of us, it's not a very good relationship. We all have these old stories and old narratives. And so I've really been working on building a meaningful and enjoying, fulfilling relationship with money. So I'll, you know, I have money that I set aside for stocks every month. Um, I'll, I'll study the markets and uh, I like investing in, in certain retail uh, stocks. I like doing ETF funds. I've really kind of gotten into that. I have, you know gone down the path of diversifying my portfolio and, you know, getting more clear on how I want to spend money, what I want to spend money on, what's enjoying, uh, what's fulfilling in terms of where I spend money and what, what our family is going to use money for, how I talk about it. And I think what's been a driving factor in that is I want my son to have a model I always talk about this in the, in the sense that like most men are modeling a version of being a man or, or masculinity based off of what they saw or didn't see and they're filling in the gaps. And I want my son to see a model in me of a man that worked diligently to have a healthy relationship with money in the sense that it wasn't something that controlled me. It wasn't something that I sacrificed everything else for. It's not something that is the driving force in my life, but it's something that I learned to have a good relationship with in the sense that it elevated my life and his and the people around us. Yeah. And that we were able to contribute to things outside of our family system because we got in, into a right relationship or a good relationship with money. And so I've, I've really been enjoying it, you know, and it's not something that I knew a damn thing about, <laughs> you know, five to seven years ago, I didn't have a clue. I didn't know that, you know, that there were Roth IRAs or, uh, you know, 401ks or in, in Canada, they call them RRSPs, uh, or tax-free savings account. Yeah. I don't know about any of that stuff. And so I've spent a good amount of time, again, being the student and being the amateur and really enjoying that. And and I think the last thing I'll say is um, I've really enjoyed knowing that I don't need to be the world's greatest expert 
with money to have a good relationship with it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that really, really helped me. A lot of what you said reminds me and my listeners should remember, we not long ago had Ken Honda Mm. on the show uh, with his book, Happy Money. And just, yeah, the spirit behind it, the feeling behind it. And uh, that's just continued to resonate with me, my thoughts about money and really to call to the carpet some of a lot of my negative thoughts about money, how I spend it. I don't have negative thoughts about how I earn it anymore. I used to, I mean, not that I was doing anything bad, but I used to struggle with, with that. But uh, yeah, so I, I hear that. I hear that flavor coming from you. Well, the last one here, Connor is uh, personal interest. And I like to cash it around uh, the, the things you're driven to do that may not be productive you know, as we say, in and of themselves, you do them to fill you up, uh, to inspire you. And I am going to lead off with something that we never got into that you just, you have a little insert in your book about that, that you, uh, or did or do sing opera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's (laughs) not the norm. That's not the norm. No, (laughs) especially for like, a, you know, the big hockey player from Northern Alberta and Canada. It's not. The, I was just say, uh, where did that come from? Where did opera right. come from? Yeah. You know, so my dad, um, my biological father in Alberta sang with the Edmonton opera chorus. Um, and so, you know, most major cities have an opera house. They have an opera company. They do, you know, operatic productions, right? I, I'm pretty sure that Denver has an opera house, I would imagine. And, you know, New York has the Met and yada, yada. And so Edmonton had, uh, an opera production company that would do operas, you know, they do, I think four different operas every year. And my dad was singing the chorus. And when I was young, I, I always loved music and, I never took any lessons. I never took voice lessons or piano lessons. And then when I was 18, I was uh, 18, 19, I was doing construction and I was working in a gravel pit in, in Northern Alberta. And so I started in February, it was like minus 40 outside. You know, I started in, in the middle of February and I was working the night shift. And after the first year, I was like, you know, I'm this 18, 19 year old kid working construction. I'm like, this is terrible. (laughs) What am I doing? You know, and I really started to question life. I started to question what I enjoyed. I started to question whether that was what my life was going to be indefinitely because I wasn't good academically. I, you know, I sort of barely graduated high school because I just didn't really care about academics and I didn't put effort into it. And, um, and I was having a conversation with my dad one day and he said, well, you know, you've always loved music. Why don't you go take a voice lesson? Hmm. And, uh, and he said, I'll, you know, go have a voice lesson with my music teacher and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll cover the first couple of lessons. And if you like it, then you can, you know, take it over. And it just turned out to be this thing that I really enjoyed. I had to develop a deep relationship with my body, with my breath. Um, it was a very sort of like primal thing, you know, singing opera is sort of like sustained yelling (laughs) and you have to make it sound beautiful. Right. But it's like, it really is like sustained yelling because you're in this huge theater and you're not mic'd up. Right. None, you know, usually if you go to a traditional opera, you're, they are not mic'd. So what you're hearing is one human being singing over top of 70 to 150 instruments. And so you really have to have this power of projection. And I loved it. It was so intriguing to me. And I, it started to sort of shape my life because at the time I was working construction, I was drinking, I was smoking, I was partying all the time. Uh, it sort of really changed my life. And so that put me on a very interesting path. But today I, I, don't, I don't sing. I think it was one of those things where uh, it's like going to school for engineering and realizing that you don't want to be an engineer. Right. Um, I really, as soon as I got out and started doing the career traveling around, I was, you know, I got to go perform in China and Czech Republic and Italy and Germany and France and New York and Canada. Um, I realized that I didn't like the career and I didn't like the industry. Yeah. And so that made it pretty clear to me that I didn't need to be there anymore. And I, that, you know, I transitioned out of that as a career. But today I have, uh, you know, a ton of stuff that I just do for fun. You know, I love kayaking, I love hiking. Um, 
I'm huge into photography. One of the things that um, I really got into in university was I started taking headshots, uh, portrait shots for all of the singers and all of the musicians. And so I got really big into photography because one of my uncles um, loved photography as a hobby. And I saw the passion that he had for photography. And he would talk about cameras and he, he loved to, he still does. He, um, he likes to go to racetracks, like Formula One and Formula Two and take photos of all the cars and he has, you know, press pass. And so I saw how much he loved it. And I was like, oh, I really like this idea. And so I started to get into it. I started to study it. And so today, um, you know, over the last 12 to 15 years, I've just continued on with photography as a, as a hobby, as something that I really love to do. And so um, I bought my dream camera uh, two years ago. And, you know, whenever we go on vacation, whenever we go hang out with friends, whenever I go and do podcasts in person with people, I'll, I'll bring my camera with me. And I'll take photos of people. I'll take photos of places and, you know, and try and capture the, just these like wonderful moments, right? That sort of distill the essence of what's happening. I, I like the idea that photography is, is sort of bottling up the present moment to redistribute later on, you know, for you to to view yeah. again, to see again, to, it's like capturing a memory real time that you can go back to. And I love that notion of being able to capture the present moment to, to, to review, uh, later on. So photography is a big one. Hiking's a big one. Um, Muay Thai, I just do for fun now. Tai Chi I'll do for fun. Um, it's also something that's very grounding. Uh, I, you know, I do some jazz singing, but it's mostly just at home for fun. Um, archery, I've really been getting into lately. And so uh, I'm just about to go buy my first compound bow and we have a big enough property that I can set up a, a range uh, on our property so I can practice, practice some archery. And yeah, I think those are, those are most of them. And then I just, I love reading. I just yeah. love reading. That's just something that I do for fun. I think, uh, la you know, last year, I think I can, I read through about like 60 or 70 books and really enjoy it. And so, yeah, I think I'll probably pause there. That's, that's probably a good summation. It's a healthy list. Now I know I love hearing what's, you know, the interest that people have and the things that you do again, that just lift you. I think it was Mike Hyatt, uh, Michael Hyatt, who was on the show. And he said, it's these, these seemingly again, unproductive things that make him the most productive. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I find the people I, I guess I'm most inspired by generally have a, you know, a strong list. It may not be long, but something, things that they invest in that, that, uh, yeah, that inspire them. And, uh, thank you. Uh, Connor, man, it's been a gift to be with you. Thank you for this behind the scenes and uh, sharing. It's given me a lot to think about and it just flat out inspired me. You inspire me. So thank you for being here. Thank you for investing in, uh, in us. Thanks for investing in me. It's been a gift. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you for joining me on this journey to elevate our own experience and improve the way we show up for others. Connor Beaton. You can find his new book anywhere. Again, it's called Men's Work, a practical guide to face your darkness and self-sabotage and find freedom. That was the catalyst again for this series. His podcast is called Man Talks. Uh, real popular. I was privileged to be a guest on there to talk about my book, What Drives You recently. Uh, on Instagram, he's got, I think, almost a couple hundred thousand followers. And it, you can find him at Man Talks. Just type in Man Talks all together and you'll find him there. Uh, friends, if you appreciate this podcast and want to share it with others, I would be so grateful if you would give us a rating on Spotify or uh, leave us a rating and a review on Apple. It helps people find us and know what we're about. You can subscribe on YouTube to watch the full episode of any of the shows these days. And you can follow me on social media where we got a lot of clips that give you little highlights of each show. Uh, you can find me at Kevin Miller. Dot co or just Kevin Miller CO. And if you want to learn how to master your own inner drive, get my book, What Drives You. You can find it on Amazon in any form. Until next time, stay driven.